All right, welcome to Couchian Podcast. I'm excited for today's episode because we have on uh, two guests, Kat Tarr and Laura Schott. And this is gonna be kind of a soft announcement for the Couch GM Soccer and the Outside the Box podcast. Is that what we're calling it? We think so. I think we're still discussing it. We're still outside the box. <laughs> Anybody <laughs> has ideas, we could yeah. field them. Nothing's yeah. nailed in or written in stone yet, so you got time. No, but that feels good though. Maybe. We'll feels see. Feels good. It'll be yeah. outside the box for sure. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. <laughs> It'll be cheesy and awesome like we are. Absolutely. Well, uh, yeah, just I wanted to really bring you guys in and get to know you a bit more, um, you know, on the podcast so that people can get to know your background, who you are, where you came from and kind of what we're doing or what you're doing. So yeah. if we just want to kind of start back from the beginning and how did you get into sports in general as a kid growing up? What was your background? What did that look like? Yeah, um, I had a brother that was born in April, a year after me, and my parents were young, um, very young parents and super pragmatic, and they wanted to go to one soccer practice. So I played on a boys team, um, soccer. He wanted to play soccer, and I said, sure, let's do it. And um, yeah, so then that just started Cat Tar playing with boys until we were a military family, we moved all over. And then when I was 12, I moved to Vancouver, Washington and started on my first girl soccer team. And the rest is history from there. That's how little kid became just absolutely enthralled with the sport. Yeah. yeah. Uh, where did you go to high school? I went to Fort Vancouver my freshman year and then Columbia River um, my sophomore year. Um, from there, um, there's this thing called ODP, Olympic Development Program, um, and I made the regional team, which is kind of like you start small and you get bigger, and the regions are one, two, three, and four, and was named captain for the regional team there, and that kind of just set off this quest to become a pro soccer player. I think I remember I was like 15 when that happened and going to River, and I just thought, yeah, like this is what I want for my life. and. Yeah. Um, that was also the year that my mom had committed to driving me to Tacoma for soccer practice. How often? Uh, four days a week. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. So we got out of school at 2.50 and my mom picked me up and we drove three hours to soccer practice. Oh man. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then games were Saturday and Sunday, like in Seattle or further Spokane, sometimes Bellingham. And so I would leave. Uh, I'd sit in the car, do my homework. I'd get out of the car, practice, get back in the car. We get home about nine o'clock at night, and I go to bed. And it was a year up team that won state every year. They were the best team in all of the state and also the nation at the time, FC Royals. And when parents ask me like, "How do I know if my kid's committed or not?" I'm like, "Would you do this?" And the, usually the answer is no. And I'm like, "Yeah, that's you're fine. Nobody should be doing that." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Gotta be a little crazy. Yeah, it's a little crazy. Yeah, for sure. But I was a little bit crazy. I never once complained. Um, I missed dances. I missed proms. I missed a lot of things. But in my mind, it wasn't a miss. It was like all I knew I wanted to do. And so, yeah, it was nuts. Which uh, women or players did you look up to growing up that motivated you? That I mean, you wanted to aspire to like the what was it, 96 women's world cup team is that what it was the just like is it 99 yeah yeah see she knows her stats i'm just <laughs> like who was on my wall mayhem probably and i know that's just so silly but she was just like very down to earth and like touchable like i've met her a few times and she signed stuff and she was also just like the first big person to come out in women's soccer and so I'm going to go total cliche and just say me. I loved her. Awesome. Yeah. And then Laura, for you, you grew up in Portland, right? Yeah, I grew up uh, suburbs. So I grew okay. up actually in the country, but a little bit south of Portland. So how did you get into the love of the sport? Well, I never traveled to Tacoma. <laughs> I don't know if I wasn't that dedicated or what, but um, I, uh, I played recreational soccer for probably about five years. So when I was in first grade, I... My mom told me the story <laughs> that I came home and I had, you know, like one of those flyers or something that they hand out at school. And I told her that I wanted to play soccer. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, those rec leagues are like three months and I did that for a number of years and then just progressed through um, finding different opportunities. My parents were really great about just finding different clubs and creating the pathway. 
Um, and eventually I found my way to, to more competitive teams. And um, when I was going to enter high school, I, I ended up uh, applying to private high schools and then ended up going to Jesuit. And I think probably the first time that I realized that, <laughs> I don't know, this was going to be a real thing in my life for quite some time was um, my freshman year. Um, I ended up moving positions and I played out wide, but I led the team in scoring from the wing. And then I scored both the goals in the championship game for the high school. And that was our second championship out of, I don't know how many now. Um, so that's kind of when I went, oh, okay, maybe, maybe I'll keep doing this. So the stat is that you scored 116 career goals in high school and that you won four consecutive state championships. Yeah, we never lost. Um, never lost a game? We never lost. And that's happened a few times. Christ. There was <laughs> <laughs> there was a run of, I don't know, five or six years that we didn't lose. Yeah, and that Man. was part of that. So um, that high school was all boys for a long time, and I was the third class of girls. So wow. once they admitted girls, it just kind of broke things open, and we started winning a lot of things. Wow. And then who, who did you look up to growing up? It sounds like the same team in 99. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm being honest, um, Women's soccer wasn't really a thing. I ended up with a 1991 World Cup women's poster, which you know, people who are familiar with the game, it's like a very um, foggy picture taken <laughs> a very long time ago that they, for some reason, turned into a poster. Pixelated. Um, yeah, it's a little bit pixelated. I don't know, was that a thing even then? Um, but yeah, I had that on my wall, but I'd say, you know, it was almost, you know, predating women's soccer when I was really little. So uh, I was a big Bo Jackson fan. Bo Jackson. There yeah, we go. Oddly enough. <laughs> I think I had every Bo Jackson poster. That's amazing. Yeah. Cool. And then, so that kind of gets us to around the high school time for both of you. Yeah. And then what were the next steps after that? Can you walk us through your recruiting process sure. and then the steps after that? Yeah. So I like really thought about this um, and I'm like so committed to just being honest because I think a lot of podcasts are like, well, everything was great and like everything was perfect. And I went we to We want to get the real. Yeah. So I'm going to just like be yeah. real. Um, so I went to a Vegas tournament um, when I was 16, Las Vegas tournament. And me and a few other Oregon ODP kids um, partook and partook, partaked. We stole some shot glasses. <laughs> Um, it's laughable now, um, and one of the girls on the team told her mom, and my dad was a federal agent for the government, and was like, you better tell the truth. And I was like, but I don't wanna. And he was like, well, you gotta tell the truth. Told the truth. Um, at that time, as I mentioned, I was the um, I was the captain for Region 4 and going to national camp in Florida, and had full ride offers to every top division one school you could ever imagine. Um, and I was kicked off of Oregon State ODP. I was kicked off of regional team. I was kicked off of national. I was asked to no longer participate in ODP. And I lost pretty much every full ride scholarship that there was outside of a few. And uh, University of Missouri was one of them. So um, I think I went to I basically went to all the full rides that the of the colleges that were like, we don't care. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, who doesn't care? <laughs> and uh, WSU was like, we don't care. I was like, I'll come to you. <laughs> and Oregon was like, hey, we also don't care. <laughs> Oregon State was like, don't care. <laughs> Going over here. Um, and then University of Missouri was like, we extra don't care. We're going to give you five years full ride. So you wow. can not only play for us for four years, but um, get your master's and we're also the number one journalism school in the nation and we know you want to study journalism um so yeah i went i went and free, froze my butt off at wsu and i was like ah, and then i went to oregon <laughs> and they were like men's football at the time and the soccer and i was like ah, and oregon state i was like okay this is cool and then i flew out to the university of missouri I'd never even been to missouri before and super old brick buildings like one of the oldest universities um and I just like loved it. I just knew that that's where I wanted to be and I wanted to get away from Vancouver and just spread my wings a little bit. And also, my I couldn't afford school. Like at the time my parents had separated and I was living with my mom who was a full-time mom and we were struggling to find housing at the time even. So I just, I like made my first very pragmatic decision was like I would love to get a journalism degree. I would love to play soccer. 
and I would love to try and get my master's. And if they're going to pay for all of that and I feel good, then let's go. Yeah. So that's how I chose my college. Wow. It's certainly not the way that I would have saw it. Um, but man, I'm, I'm glad it happened that way. Looking back. A couple questions to that. Uh, was Missouri known for women's soccer at all in the mm -hmm. nation? And then uh, follow up. Um, you know, typically there's like four years of eligibility in college, correct? Yeah. Or was that different back then to where no. you had five years of eligibility or they were, were they going to redshirt you? No, they were just going to pay for another year of college so that I can get another year of So college. after you're done playing, you could still go to school? Yeah, I get okay. your master's degree at yep. no cost. Gotcha. Which it ended up being pretty cool because there was no pro league after college. So that was another thing too. It was like, I wasn't thinking, oh, where can I go to go on to pro? There wasn't pro, like there just was no league. So for me, it was, what, what do I want to be <laughs> when I grow up? <laughs> um, and no, University of Missouri was not great. They were okay, they're, you know, um, but they had told me that they were committed to being somebody. And the coach, Brian Blitz, um, who's at WSU now, and they've got a crazy winning um, streak Actually, all my co coaches that were at Mizzou are now at WSU, which is hilarious. Really? Um, and yeah, so no, we weren't known, um, but somehow they had, for my class, recruited like the number 25 class, which everyone was like, what? What? How'd you guys do that? And it's funny because, man, we were like the group of misfits. Like there was one girl who had like a one point nothing GPA <laughs> that they brought in. They were like going to give her a chance. And another girl who like, scored the most goals but had a baby so we were just like honestly and then there's me who like you know nobody wanted to touch and they were like hey all of you guys come <laughs> let's do something and I graduated that year or I graduated from Missouri with a, a big 12 ring and a conference championship ring we're the only team in Mizzou history to win both of those things in any sport men or women's wow. um ranked top 10 in the nation my junior and senior year I went to the NCAA tournament so don't give up on those misfits because we will <laughs> we will prove you something wrong and we were we were we were tough I mean we we might not have been the most skilled or whatever but yeah you didn't want to play us we were nasty yeah it's interesting <laughs> everything happens for a reason you yeah. know what I mean? Some of those decisions, although not the best at the time, they lead you to where you needed to be. Yeah. And I learned how to be out on my own. You know, there are like so many college kids that like came home every day. I didn't, I never went home. Like genuinely, I went home one time in four years. Mm -hmm. And then when I was done with Mizzou and I won this conference and I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? I got a call that the women's league was going to start the pro league and I was going to get drafted to Chicago. So, yeah, everything does happen for a reason. Yeah, and that was right when you were graduating? What was yeah. that was happening? Well, no, like, I, yeah, I was going to graduate that year, okay. and then my coach tells me, hey, um, they want to, Chicago wants to draft you into the pro league. And I was like, there's a pro league? Like, I didn't even know. Um, so, yeah, I got drafted out of University of Missouri. Um, I had to leave school, and guess what? They paid for five years. So I got to come back after I played for Chicago and finish my degree. Wow. And I would not have been able to do that if I would have chose any other college, including those top Division One schools. I would have been in debt after if I chose to play pro. So I got the option and like to play pro and still be debt free. And and I there was no choice other than that for me. So I just felt like man, it was written for me to yeah. do that. Yeah. And uh, you still majored in journalism? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Fun fact, you don't actually get to major in journalism if you play Division One soccer because you can't. So like you gotta be doing this stuff all day. Um, so I I, ma I double majored in, in communication and psychology, which okay. then you just become a realtor after that. You still got the papers. I, yeah. yeah, still got the papers, still <laughs> That's did all that matters, it. Really. Um, I got to come back also that fifth year and help coach University of Missouri soccer as a volunteer coach. And then they won the conference again. So like, I couldn't have written it better, it's yeah. awesome. Awesome. And then, yeah. Laura, for you. I feel like our stories wind around and then we end up at the same spot where we did a fifth year and we got drafted. And right? <laughs> you know, they just... Yeah. You That's didn't awesome. steal any shot glasses, though. I didn't steal shot glasses. I didn't... Loser. Yeah. <laughs> Could have gotten a real estate <laughs> She didn't get caught. <laughs> uh, gosh, I feel like I was super pragmatic about it, which isn't going to surprise Kat and eventually will not surprise you guys. Um, yeah, I kind of went through the process 
as it was just kind of laid out. Um, I didn't know where I was going to go or exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to be um, probably close to, to home um, for family reasons. I wanted to be able to get home quickly if I needed to. So I had taken visits. I ended up only taking three official visits. I took one to Michigan. I went to Washington. Uh, and then I went to Berkeley where I ended up uh, going to school. So mm-hmm. I only took three of my five. I did a lot of unofficial visits um, at that <laughs> I don't date myself. This is so old. <laughs> Back then, you actually went through the process, and then you got recruited during your senior year. And uh, so people sent me all kinds of letters and stuff, and every day was like this whole thing of mail, and my mom probably still has it somewhere. Um, so yeah, I went through the process, went on those visits, and eventually landed on uh, going to Berkeley. I ended up double majoring in Berkeley. Um, so there we go, another tie-in. Yeah. Um, what did you major in? I majored in politics and communications, okay. which was pretty common. Um, some of my good friends there also did that. So we kind of all did it together. They didn't, it sounds like it's fancy and like I double majored and did two totally separate things, but (laughs) there was actually a lot of crossover. Um, But yeah, I ended up going to Berkeley, which was uh, quite a turn for me. I think looking back on it, I'm a little bit surprised that (laughs) I was able to to be near Oakland for four years after living in the country for so long. (laughs) It was just loud and a lot was going on, but it was also a really cool place to be at the time. Um, It was right during the first dot-com boom. So all those things were happening. I remember my freshman year being in a ed class, and we went to the library, and they were, you know, we're getting on the internet, which is newish, which is also weird to say. Um, and then the we were going to try out, right? <laughs> and we were going to try out this new thing called Google that no one was trying yet <laughs> in 1999. <laughs> fancy, yeah, super fancy. So uh, yeah, we were all like, "What is this?" And you know, it is what it is. But yeah, my four years, I I was super focused on on soccer and I think you know I people that know me now see me as a super kind of I think sometimes intense coach that you know just sees the game wants to be really competitive and I was very much that way on the field Um, one of the comments that I've gotten from people is that I'm pretty drastically different on and off a field which I think is pretty pretty accurate I think sometimes people expect me to be very intense all the time and I'm not (laughs) yeah you just have that Uh, switch that you flip yeah I was very much a a switch person I'd cross the lines and I'd be one way and I'd go home and I'd be you know totally be myself yeah I really kind of had to put on a um I I would almost liken it to acting it was like right now I need to be the best soccer player Mm -hmm. and then I would go into the field and then be as good as I could be but um yeah had a great four years um had wonderful coaches that I still stay in contact with today um wonderful teammates lifelong friends and um yeah. So I guess to kind of wrap it all up, um, yeah, at the end, I ended up um, being the leading scorer in Cal history and got drafted. She which... puts her hand on her face <laughs> like, I don't want to say this. I know. I... <laughs> okay. So you were talking about how you were intense on the field and then not so much off the field. Yeah. I, I think just in general, I'm a person that likes to, I don't know, do what I feel like the situation calls for. So, I mean, in order to be a goal scorer, a good athlete, you have to have a certain intensity that I think is pretty darn high. At least it is for me. I mean, it's more natural for other people. But if I was the way I am most of the time on the field, it (laughs) certainly wouldn't have been leading anything in scoring. Um, But uh, my senior year, I ended up actually getting injured. So I was injured for half of my senior year. Um, I tore, partially tore my MCL. So uh, it was an accident, but I ended up getting hit in practice and I, I walked off the field and I was like, my knee doesn't feel right. And so I started to like, you know, move and side shuffle and like try and figure it out. And I was like, it just feels like it's opening. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, I was out for uh, almost every game, except for um, then I went right back into Pac-10, <laughs> <laughs> Pac-10 play. Uh, so that's really, those are really the games that I played my senior year. So to clarify, you're out almost all your senior year and you were still the leading scorer in Cal history? Yeah, I could have scored more. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I could have scored more. And, like, just so everyone knows, like, Alex Morgan went to Cal. So when we say you're the leading goal scorer in Cal history. Alex Morgan who? Yeah, right? It's like, <laughs> it's not, like. Yeah, one of the best, yeah. No, I have a lot of respect for her. She, you know, obviously is who she is right now, and she's doing, I mean, things beyond the field. And so. But still pretty damn cool. Sorry. It's a cool, it's a cool fact. Did, like, did you two ever play against each other in college? I, I think that could have been a <laughs> an inter- interesting matchup. <laughs> the world would have exploded. <laughs> I don't know if it would have been fun or if it would have been scary. No, we could never get it to. She was coaching when I entered into She could have actually okay. recruited me. 
Maybe, because so so <laughs> she I, saw that you had your thing going on. It was yeah, like we can't was take like, her. We can't <laughs> take her. <laughs> yeah, not easy to hear about the shot glasses. Yeah. Right. Um, I uh, post college. So my senior year, um, I got drafted, which I ended up falling pretty far in the draft, which was very disappointing for me at the time. But I got drafted to what at the time uh, who was the Washington Freedom. It was a stacked team, um, and being a forward, Abby Wambach was there, and Mia Hamm was there, and I went in knowing, like, okay, either I'm going to play somewhere else or I'm probably not going to play a whole lot this year. So, I mean, the first task when you get drafted, there's no there's no um, guarantee that you're going to stay or play. They could just cut you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I ended up making the team, and then uh, I guess at the time I sort of had the choice whether I wanted to leave and go try out somewhere else or if I wanted to stay, and I chose to stay. And we won the national championship that year, which was amazing. But also, you know, I played a lot less. And my thought at the time was that I was going to be there. And then I was going to, you know, Mia Hamm retired in, I believe, 2004. So she was going to retire. Mm-hmm. But plot twist, the league folded. Because the first two professional women's leagues uh, folded. Um, so it folded in 2003. So my first year in the league, and my only year that I ended up playing uh, in the U.S., uh, was the third year and final year of the first league. Okay. Walk me through, uh, so the league was founded or started. What did that look like? How many teams were there? What, oh, man, what can you recall from that? I'm my knowledge on this. <laughs> okay, so how many teams were there? Uh, I believe I believe there were eight. Okay. Uh, mostly East Coast, uh, very East Coast-based. Yeah. Um, wasn't a team in L.A. yet. We ended up playing the final in San Diego, so at the University of San Diego. Um The league was super competitive. I mean, our team, if I went through, I always hesitate to name team names on that team because there were so many people that I'm going to like forget to mention some, you know. And somehow like if you forget them, they're not, but it's just too many big names. It's just too many big names. It's too many people that have done important things. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So, you know, in hindsight, being on that team was, was pretty special and, and pretty fun. But, you know, at the end of the season, you know, we have the final, we end up winning the final, and then I asked my coach, actually, before we left for that trip, I said, hey, um, I'm going back to college, <laughs> college being in Berkeley. We're flying out to San Diego. We're based, obviously, in Washington, D.C. I was like, can I just fly up to college? <laughs> so I think Saturday we played the final, um, and then I flew up to college on Sunday, and I put together my furniture and went to school on Monday. <laughs> when did the U.S. national team stuff happen? Uh, the first time I got called into uh, the youth national teams was in high school. So I got called in then, but I, I didn't I didn't stick. <laughs> so they kind of threw me back out. And then uh, my sophomore year in college, I scored 23 goals. And then they called me back in. So Jill Ellis <laughs> called me in. And uh, that was awesome. I mean, she ended up stepping away from the national teams um, for a little while at that time. So I didn't have her for very long, but I had her. I had April Heinrichs, Jerry Smith, um, yeah, Leslie Gallimore. So the league folded in 2003? League folded in 2003. So the only season that I played uh, was 2003. Okay. Yeah. And then you went to go play internationally, it sounds like? Oh, well, kind of. I don't, I don't know if how deep we want to get into this one, but... Any international, so at the as time, far as you can. <laughs> yeah. we're not going to go that deep. Uh, All the details. <laughs> period. Really? Hard stop. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So when the league folded, there was a team, still is a team, called the Storm in, out of Sacramento that was founded by a lobbyist named Jerry Zanelli, who's a name, it's a name that if you're in soccer circles, you he's passed away since. But he would, he was very into women's soccer. And he was very supportive, um, gave a lot of time, a lot of his own money to, to fund that team. So a lot of us in the Bay Area and across the country, frankly, and internationally, I mean, CC played on that team. Uh, Brandy Chastain was a regular on that team. Uh, other Brazilian internationals, lots of players from Cal or Stanford or Santa Clara would go and play there in the summers. So in 2004, we, <clears throat> we played in what was then the semi-professional league. We all kind of just like fell into that <laughs> since we didn't have anywhere else to go. So we won the national championship that year, and then uh, when that <laughs> wins, wins state every year, wins all these different championships. Just yeah, just winning championships. Yeah. <laughs> so 
when the season was over, uh, again, I moved back to Berkeley where I was living. And then my friend, uh, Emily Burt, who played at Stanford, called me because she, for whatever reason, ended up going to Russia. And she was like, hey, they want more people. And I said, oh, I guess I could go. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, yeah, got my, got my stuff together and lived there for a little while. Interesting. <laughs> so that was probably, a, yeah, an experience. I played, I played in the Champions League. That's probably the most fun fact out of that. We ended up flying to Denmark, and I played in uh, UEFA. Okay. Yeah. So then uh, California Storm was your last year playing in soccer? Yeah. Yeah, and then I pretty much went straight into coaching, Division One coaching. Okay. Yeah. And then getting back over to, to Cat with your story, um, college, and then after college, what did that look like? Was that the second iteration or, uh, yeah, of the I league, mean, or was WPS. that the third? Was that three? Yeah, it was two. It was two? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So WPS, Women's Professional Soccer, came. Um, so the draft very much, well, first I went, had to go to a combine. So, like, imagine, though, that the combine called everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, of course, the national team players, like Carly Lloyd, went to Chicago. Like, she didn't have to go to the combine. But everybody else who wasn't, like, those top had to go to this combine and compete. Um, and it was terrifying and awesome at the same time. You just like literally played games in front of all of the best coaches in the world. And um, people be like, I would, I go to Notre Dame. I go to Cal. I go to Stanford. They're like, where'd you go? And I'm like, University of Missouri, one of the Big 12. Like, mm, okay. Which is funny because at the time that was a real thing. Like people would be like, oh. No, for real. But now, I mean, it's it's a big deal. It's Did a big conference. It's a big school. Sure. Now it has a mu it hits much different now, but at the time, no, it didn't hit at yeah. all. There was no hitting. <laughs> it was like it didn't have the status that no, other it had places. No status. Yeah. And I was the only player from the University of Missouri. It'd be like twelve kids from Stanford. Like, here's our team. I'd be like one little Missouri flag. And they're like, where's Missouri located? Is it in the United States? Like, um, but. Um, I did what Kat Tar's always done. I just worked my ass off. Like, I remember one time they put me on the wing and they started all like the top players. And then they were like, all right, second half, you can Missouri kid go in. And I remember just running my ass off. And finally, my defender was like, stop running. <laughs> You're making us look bad. And I was like, never. <laughs> and, uh, if yeah. he dies, he dies. Yeah, I was <laughs> like, I'm, I get like 20 minutes on this field. I'm going to touch the ball as much as I can. I went back to the University of Missouri. We, we went to Brazil um, my senior year. Um, and of course, when we're in Brazil, we find out if I got drafted or not. And so I'm on this bus, like crying because I'm pouting. And literally, we're in like Sao Paulo where there's just like homelessness, like camps of foreverness if you've ever been in Brazil. And my coach comes sit next to me, puts his arm around me. He's like, look outside the window, cat. He's like, you're crying. Because you, you don't have internet right now. And I was like, that was one of the first moments where I was just like, yeah, this there's stuff bigger than this game. I can't have all of my worth on it. But then like an hour later, I did find out I got drafted <laughs> <laughs> at the airport. Um, so yeah, and then um, I left college. I drove in my crap car that barely made it to Chicago from the University of Missouri because I literally like had no money. Um, I stayed with this family who had an elevator in their um, house and I had a nanny in my own room and the father, I wonder if they watch this, the father was like worked for NASA and the girls, I mean it was just, it was amazing. Um, same thing, like I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go play and then Carly Lloyd and all these amazing players are like, there's the bags and the balls, you need to pump them and I'm like, <laughs> like this isn't what I necessarily signed up for. Um, same thing. I mean, I was there for three, four months, and I got an option to like be a, uh, what they called it something, a discovery player or something. And I just knew I was never gonna play. And I would have had to have gotten like a part-time job in Chicago, which I wasn't in love with the area. It was winter, it was very cold. Like there was a wave, like that f like froze mid-wave. And I was like, don't like that <laughs> at all. You avoided Washington State because of the cold, and now you end up back in the cold. Yeah, that's that's a new cold. Frozen <laughs> yeah, right. waves is like Arctic. <laughs> so, um, so then I did what anybody would do, and then I went to Buffalo, which was even colder, yep. which um, had basically all of the Discovery players playing. I know it makes no sense. 
Um, so I played for Buffalo. The league folded. Funny story. League two. <laughs> Sayonara. <laughs> um, and when it folds, they're like, hey, all you ladies. Oh, that's a good story. Yeah. There's no soccer. How about, is yeah. that like mid-season? You, you think it's, yeah. Oh, yeah. They'll just, oh, they'll they told just... us before the season. They almost didn't have a third season. Like, when I got to Washington, D.C., they were almost like, we're not going to do this one. And then they were like, we're going to do it, but this is it. But it might not happen at any point type thing? Well, originally, I think it was $40 million was set aside for that league to last five years, and they blew through it in two. So then the third year was just like a, like, I guess we'll give it one more go. We'll see how long <laughs> these funds last. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. Same Merrill, it just... They came out and they're like, it's over. Because we were all basically playing on this Buffalo team to try to, to get there, right? And so flew back home, Van, Van Tucky, Washington, came back here and was like working at Salmon Creek Indoor Soccer Arena coaching three-year-olds, which I did this morning again. It's full circle. <laughs> <laughs> I was with Nova like, oh man, I'm here again. <laughs> Um, and then my agent, so you had to have an agent when you went to the league, called and said there's a team in Berlin, Germany that needs a center back. And it was December. And I was like, yes. So I just packed my bags up again. Man, I've been living in a suitcase now for most of my life anyway. So yeah, I took a, a first Bundesliga spot for TV Berlin, um, got off the airplane, and got picked up by the most hunky German man I've ever seen in my <laughs> life, who was going to be my translator. Um, 13 years married to that man as of like a few days ago, so it was funny because I literally got off the plane, full disclosure, I had partied my ass off the night before with my <laughs> girlfriends, I'm moving to Berlin, I'm playing pro soccer, <laughs> like side ponytail, like pillow, I was told that an older man would pick me up from the club and then there's this guy with like the tightest jeans and v-neck I've ever seen <laughs> in my life, like 6'2", just drink water and I was like, please God, no. <laughs> Please no. He's looking at the screen. I'm like, oh no, don't. He's like, hi, are you Katar? I'm your translator. I was like, German accent. <laughs> I was like, I literally wrote my mom. I have the Facebook message saved. Like, I'm so screwed. I'm in I don't even know if I can focus on the game. This guy is so hot. Um, but I did. I played some soccer. Um, that team ended up going down to second Bundesliga. Another team called S S um picked me up, and I was like, "Hey, I definitely want to come play with you, but I got a boyfriend, which was Fabi. His name is Fabian, by the way." <laughs> and um, so I wrote my boyfriend into my pro contract that I was that I wanted because we were like, you know, we've only been together a little bit of time. We need a two bedroom, so we got a two bedroom apartment. Um, and I played in the first Bundesliga for four years. I got to play against the world's best players. A lot of the American players came over and played. It was honestly like the, the biggest change of my life because I'm I'm a runner, I'm fast, track athlete. And I think every American coach was like, oh, she's fast. We're just gonna have her play like in the middle of a three back cause she can just run. And I get to Germany and they're like, stop running. <laughs> just control the ball with your feet. And I was like- Just uh, play soccer more. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> They were like, you don't have to kick the shit out of it. You can just pass it. And so... You don't have to be oh. big and hit it hard. Yeah, yeah. And like, <laughs> stay on your feet. Why are you slide tackling everyone? And I was like, what? It's Big 12 soccer right here. They're like, no, nobody wants to be. Nobody wants to get hurt. And I was like, whoa. So a totally different style of play. Oh, God. For the first hour, we would do passing patterns. And my first touch was shite. So like, it was tough to the start. I mean... I still was starting, I was still, you know, but it was a complete change of, of the game and it was so lovely to actually like tactically love the game and fall in love with it mm -hmm. and see it from a, a, a European perspective. And my coach ended up being the German national team coach like two years later. He was just a soccer visionary, a soccer mind. So completely different. And then of course, I find out that National Women's Soccer League, NWSL, was going to start in the US. And so my last year, the NWSL started and they had a Portland team. Um, that year, um, my husband, Fabian and I had gotten married the year before. And so he was going to school in Essen and I was playing for the Bundesliga. And like four months into my season, I'm like, I'm tired, something's wrong. <laughs> what could be wrong here? 
Um, <laughs> then I found out I was pregnant. So um, I stopped playing. I started working for the team, and we had our son Elias. And we had him, and we just knew that I needed to go back to the U.S. and get support from my family. Like, I wanted to be with my mom um, really badly, and my brother, too, who was, was a year younger than me. And and so Elias was two weeks old, I and we moved back to Portland. And uh, then I get an email one day from Portland Thorns. They're like, hey, we're having this open tryout, and we know that you're in town. We know we heard you move back. And I'm literally, like five months postpartum like I'm nursing an infant like thinking what and then I'm like oh that would be cool <laughs> like to play in front of your entire community that you like grew up in yeah how rad could that be so generally like I was like okay I'll see you in February I had Elias at the end of August so September October November December June so six months was the try. like six months after I gave birth was a trial um and I started running in January so I literally just went to the Columbia River High School track. I remember with a stroller, just like running like 10 minute miles, barely exhausted. Mm -hmm. And my mom was like, ah, I don't know, might be. And I'm like, oh, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. I got to the tryout, was head and shoulders better than everybody else. The coach like was like, okay, yeah, here, here's your spot. And, and then was starting for the Portland Thorns. Literally was a baby on my boob, on the plane rides, going everywhere. They would find uh, somebody to watch Elias. I literally hand him over, go play 90 minutes, get him back, like not sleep in the hotels at night. They gave me my own room. I was one of the only moms in the whole league. Um, and who would have known after like seven, six, seven games, I um, tore my meniscus in the game. And, then and that ended it. Yeah, my brother passed away in a car accident, as you guys know, um, too, at the end of that year. And I was making $1,200 a month um, as a mom with a husband in nursing school, living in my mom's basement, being expected to go sign autographs and pack stadiums and do all of the things that professional athletes do. And I was exhausted. I just had my sixth knee surgery and I just figured, you know what, this I'm not in love with it anymore. Even even playing in front of everybody and, you know, wh literally all your teachers and your friends, everybody shows up to support you. Know, I had 22,000 fans at the Seattle game. My brother was there afterwards. Like, it's some of the best memories that I have with my family, but it, it gets not worth it anymore. And that was the line. And so that was the year I decided to step away from playing and going to coaching. A couple of follow-up questions to that story. Um, story ever. <laughs> no, no, you're good. <laughs> I love it. Um, All right. So, I mean, I, I went to Europe, uh, London, and then I went up to Manchester with, with a buddy of mine, and we planned our trip around seeing Manchester United play Chelsea at Old Trafford. Yeah. And yeah. anytime I go to Europe, I want to plan around a soccer match like that because just be able to experience the culture through sport, which I can, you know, like baseball and football here, soccer, the rest of the world, basically. Yeah. Um, what was it like playing in Germany, playing in a spot to where like, soccer is the sport? And then also when you came over here, were you able to take those different tools and playing style that you learned over there and utilize that over here to your advantage? Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean that's, first off, it's rad because literally there's a field and then there's like a bar on like next to the field. <laughs> and it's just like all the dudes and gals with their scarves on, watching you train with beers, and then the guys come on, and and then there's the youth kids that want to be you, and we're re helping run training, and literally chicks with the tattoo of like <laughs> S and Schoenebeck on Culturally, their arms. Literally, it's like a totally different world. It's it, yeah, it is. yeah. Like it's just it was your it was the hangout spot. Like it's, a, it's almost it's a lifestyle where mm -hmm. you like it has you know like there's a bar and there's a restaurant and there's people hanging out and the kids are there because that's what they aspire to be and it's all kind of welcomed as part of a a larger development system. Yeah, right? like the little kids that played in would come be our ball kits for practice and yeah. they'd watch our whole training session with their scarves on. And yeah, it you don't we don't have that here. We don't have that here. I think we've made progress, but it, it's been slow. Yeah. For whatever reason it has been more segmented and more difficult to make that progress. Yeah. Um, whereas like in Germany it's just it's more natural. It's just like this is what we do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, coming back to the thorns it was like I, I 
I was able to be that fast, super athletic person, but actually know how to play soccer. Mm -hmm. And honestly, if I would not have gone over to Germany, I wouldn't have played in the NWSL. Because that was always what was missing, was the ability just to like be calm on the ball. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm grateful how it all ended up for sure. And then so po post playing careers, you get into coaching. Do yeah, just... so like when I, when the first league folded here, which I mean also speaks to the, the progress of women's soccer into the leagues, like I'm, I'm old enough or I'm far enough ahead of Kat, which is, I mean, what are you, six years younger than me? Yeah. So in those six years, that whole, that whole system developed to a point where, you know, she went, and I have a few friends that went to Germany and played earlier, but it, it just wasn't the same as the infrastructure that was there when, like, Kat went. Yeah, I mean, I saved like fifty thousand American dollars from my time over there. They gave me a car. They gave me, like, the community was like, "What do you? Here is a grocery cart. Go get your own groceries. Here's a car from the car dealership. Oh. Restaurant passes. I mean, people love the game that much, and your family now. Yeah, you know, like you're. It was just it's so different. And then I came to the Thorns. They're like, "Want to start and play in front of twenty thousand people and have to sign all your house all the time? We'll give you twelve hundred dollars. You can live in your mom's basement." <laughs> I was like, <laughs> deal. Yeah, I'm like, let's do it. So some of us didn't play that long. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, different. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what happened. That's just what right. it was. It's still, it's, and now where they are now, because I, I. Yeah, now, I mean, if I, if I was in the same situation where I had gotten drafted later and went to a team where there were these, you know, like mega stars. Um, you know, I could go to any number of international leagues or I could move to another team and I'd have an agent. When I played, they weren't, they weren't doing that. I mean, yeah, you have, guys didn't even have agents, We didn't right? have agents. I mean, people on the national team had agents. Sure. Yeah, but I mean, it wasn't like everybody had an agent. You were just kind of like there and trying to figure it out and like, oh, if I go somewhere else, I got to figure out who to call and how to navigate the whole thing kind of on your own. So Man. a lot yeah. of things, uh, it advanced pretty quickly in retrospect. Huge strides. Yeah. If you measure it that way. Yeah. Seems slow, but it's made a lot of progress. Yeah, for sure. And so you get into coaching. Yeah, What's I mean, that if you wanted to stay like? in the game, yeah. you had to go into coaching. So um, also, uh, sadly, my brother passed away. So I had made the decision that um, at that time, that was the end of 2004, that I was going to move back because I just, I needed to. So I moved back and um, started coaching club and then Funny story. The, so the coach at the time uh, at Portland State had a very good year and took the job at University of Oregon. And so uh, I just on a whim put put my resume together and I was like, I really don't want to be the head coach there, but I need to like let them know that I'd like to be there. Um, so I put my resume together and I went downtown and I just went to the athletic department, which you have to go to the fourth story of this building downtown. and. Uh, just walked up to the front desk and gave him my information and said, hey, you know, I'm interested in being an assistant coach. I don't at all feel prepared to be a head coach, but I'd be interested. And so I got a call not too long after that, and they called me and said, I don't even know. I don't know if you're supposed to do this. Uh, <laughs> they called me and said, hey, do you want to just run sessions for the team while we don't have a coach? This is a Division One school. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to just fill in and... You want to just, like, sign a contract for a month and see how this goes? <laughs> <laughs> so As the like acting head coach, basically. Yeah, it was the spring. This is March. Okay. Right. So yeah. this is the spring, and um, soccer seasons are you know in the fall in collegiate sports. So yeah. So I'm what am I? Twenty three. Wow. <laughs> wow coaching, coaching my division one team of twenty eighteen to twenty two year olds. Um, so my start into college athletics, I drew a pretty hard line because you know I was like, we're not friends. <laughs> like I have to be your head coach. So anyway, I, I started coaching and um, coached in the spring and then, you know, they, they kind of talked to me. They were like, you know, are you interested in this? And I was like, I literally don't know anything about it. I cannot do this, <laughs> but I do want to be an assistant. So um, kindly, uh, the SWA who was running the search let me do everything. Like she let me go on all of the, um, all the interviews, went to dinner with all of the candidates, um, one of which I'm friends with, Kat Mertz. <laughs> So I was on her interview when she was an assistant at UCLA. She came up and interviewed for that job and ended up passing on it and going to UNLV. Uh, but yeah, I went on all of the interviews. I watched the interview process. I got to see it firsthand. I kind of learned what I already knew. Like I watched, you know, the mass questions and I, you know, would have a sense of like, wow, that's a really good answer or wow, I really shouldn't have said that. <laughs> yeah. um, so then at the end of that, uh, they ended up, 
you know, making their offers and um, the person that they picked ended up, you know, taking the job and uh, then uh, asked me to be an assistant. So I became an assistant there and uh, was an assistant for three years. And then I, for various reasons, I was either going to, uh, I, I thought I was going to leave. So I thought I was going to leave the program and move on. So uh, Mark Francis, who was a longtime coach at Kansas, called me and he asked me to interview for the assistant position there. And so I flew out to Kansas, interviewed, had a great time. He's amazing. It was great. And uh, really thought I was probably going to go there. And then while I was on that trip, the athletic director of Portland State called me and said, are you interested in this job? Uh, the head coach is leaving. And I said, oh, OK, maybe. And in my head, I was going, yeah, probably I'm going to do that because I <laughs> when I got into it and started getting offered positions and jobs and opportunities to leave, I just I really didn't have it in me to leave. I've just always been a Portland person and mm -hmm. um, always invested in this community. And so, yeah, when I got that opportunity, I literally flew back from Kansas. My dad picked me up from the airport, drove me to Portland State, and I had an impromptu interview at Portland State, and then they ended up hiring me. So then I was the head coach there for nine years. How old were you when you were first hired as a head coach? 25? 25 was the head coach of a D1 I think school. I 25 or 26. I think it was 25. I think I turned 26 it's pretty wild, yeah. Isn't yeah. it? So I think back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so to me, like, you know, crossing the line and kind of being a more competitive, different person when I'm on a soccer field, like, you know, when your players are 22 or if they were fifth years, 23, and you're 25, you're going to draw a pretty hard line so that right. they know that, you know, you're not going to hang out with them. And, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. But so. what was nice was I already knew the players. I knew right where we were at. I could pick up right where we left off because I was in the program, which was a huge, huge advantage. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it ended up not being exactly what we thought it would be. Uh, so we had some, some rough times in the beginning. The first few years were, were hard. And then, uh, yeah, 2009 is when we kind of broke through and we had some – good players that then aged forward and were able to lead. And we ended up winning four conference championships. We ended up, we, we finished in the top two for seven years straight, which was a blessing. And also, I mean, if I'm being honest, to be that young and to like take on that much stress of setting the bar that high that early, mm -hmm. it wore on me pretty hard. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, every year I was like, well, I'm either gonna be first or I'm gonna be worse than I am. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I had, to, I had to mentally, you know, like work through that every year. Uh, so I ended up being coach of the year of the conference uh, a couple times, and my my philosophy on the the year would be, which also was stressful, was I would schedule the hardest teams we could we could play. So in non conference we would play. I mean we played Texas Tech. Let me back up. My first year, <laughs> I adopted a schedule that had in the same weekend UCLA and USC on it when they were both in the final four the year before. Oh, man. Yeah, and we were playing at PCC Rock Creek because the university doesn't have a field. Also, fun fact, finished in the top two every year and we didn't have a field. So <laughs> so we take we take the uh, – actually, the USC game was at the rec center. It was on field one at the rec center. And we were tied with them until almost – it was like the 67th minute, and they ended up breaking through. So we played really well. And we, we ended up losing 2-0, and – Fast forward to Sunday, you know, we felt like we did great. They were defending national champions, and we, you know, took them the distance and competed the whole time. And then uh, Sunday, we played Jill Ellis's team, UCLA, uh, that had Lauren Chaney, and I don't even remember all the people that were on that team at that time, but there were a number of longtime national team players. And we didn't have anything left. So I <laughs> just remember sitting on this field. Uh, the game starts, and I'm you know, trying to coach them through it. And I'm just uh, not too far into it. I'm like, yep, this is just going to. This is just going to be how it is. We're real tired and, you know, tried to support the team through it. But, uh, yeah, it was, that was a tough one. So, you know, just sitting there on the side of the field looking over at Jill Ellis going, I don't know what I'm going to do to make this any better. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's how we started. We just challenged ourselves all the way through. So non-conference, I'd always schedule. I mean, we always played, you know, top 10 teams, Pac-12 teams. When you're in a conference like the Big Sky, you know, you're on the West Coast. There's not a lot of West Coast teams. So – in order to schedule and also fit within the constraints of a mid-major Division One budget, you end up playing teams that, if I'm being honest, are adding you so they can get a win. 
right? Right. So get some confidence. Yeah, that, basically. which, which is yeah. a mental grind for a coach that's trying to build a program, right? Because yeah. you're looking at it going like, okay, we could we could end up just under 500. Maybe we could knock it out of the park and end up 500 in non-conference. There's a chance we could not win a game non-conference. And that was a reality every single year mm-hmm. that we started uh, the season. So the philosophy behind it became, okay, if we have to play all of these very difficult teams, can we get good enough and keep our confidence through those games that when we get to conference play, when we play the big sky teams, we're going to be able to roll a bit. And I was fortunate enough for that philosophy to, to work out. Yeah. Awesome. And then, so uh, how did you get out of coaching and into real estate and what you're doing now? Whew, you want to start first? Cause you went into real estate first. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I left while I was playing for the Thorns and being a mom, my mom was in real estate and she met, she was, she'd been in real estate since I was a little kid. And then she met another gentleman who's my stepdad who's also in real estate. And they were like, get your real estate license. Stop doing the soccer thing. And I'm like, I can't stop doing the soccer thing. I don't know how. So I had my real estate license, but right after I was done playing, I went in and played, or I went into coaching. I coached at Clark College, which is the local college team here. And we did really well. And I was the youth director for a local soccer club here. Um, started the, a semi-pro women's team, the first one ever in Vancouver, and won the championship our first year. So I was, like, very into it. Um, but, you know, when I was playing for the Thorns and playing in the pro league, like, it's no secret that year, 2014, was the year where we had Paul Riley, who um, did a lot of bad things, you know. And um, later on, I, you know, um, got a call to from some of the other players like we need to say something and so i backed them and they said something and it opened up a huge space for us to really look at the women's game and see a lot of holes i mean we're talking coaches having sex with players we're talking coaches saying hey if you make out with each other we won't run tomorrow what yeah, I mean, my coach at the Thorns one time said it at halftime, um, and then there's Cat. I mean, he would just – you were used to getting yelled at, um, but, like, why did I pick a player who has a baby? Like, one of our players who's still playing, who's amazing, you're fat and you need to lose weight. And one player who's on the U.S. national team who's, like, amazing, why are you on the – just, like, why are you on the U.S. national team? Just, like – killed us and we were oftentimes told just like you're lucky to play that has always been the message like imagine being in love with something and giving up everything you have and just constantly being told you're just lucky to play and unfortunately I thought that that was a problem and that those holes were a problem just in that game but then as I went into the youth game and into college coaching guess what (laughs) it's a problem from the bottom up and something that um, I was so excited that the women that I played with like came out and blew the whistle because it really just um, it left a lot of um, left a lot of holes and the people stepping into those holes are people like Karina LeBlanc at the Thorns, um, you know, former national team player who's now the GM, like amazing women that are stepping into these roles to support women. Um, and we have a lot of work to do in the youth side. And so honestly, what happened is I I just said, I'm not gonna be able to change this on my own. How can I change and help my community and how can I help the youth grow? And I know it sounds wild, but I was like, honestly, if I start a really amazing real estate business and actually do things differently, like I love my mom, I love my stepdad, they both work on my team, but at the time nobody was doing it. They were like putting a sign in the yard taking some pictures, some of them with their cell phones, and then getting paid a lot of money. And I just said, you know what? Like, if I can sell a bunch of homes and do what I do and make it so much easier on the people, like, I was was embarrassed to go into real estate, honestly. I was like, I have a degree. I'm a former pro soccer player. Like, I'm going to be a realtor? Like, I just, I wasn't sure that that was my calling. But then I sat down and I'm like, I... I have an opportunity to step in here, really do good for the community. Like you, as you guys know, I stage, I own my own staging company. I don't like 
hire out thousands and thousands of dollars of stagers to come stage somebody's house and then charge the seller. I literally buy the furniture. I own my staging units. I have a cleaning company that works for me. I have contractors that work full time for me. Like we go into a home and we're charging usually less commission than the guys that are sticking the sign in the yard. And I mean, I'm 110 five star reviews. Like I am changing the game in real estate and I and it comes from like that embarrassment where I was just like, I can't be that person that does nothing. Just like I wasn't that person in the game and did nothing. You know, I, I was a leader. And so that's what it came down to. And guess what? I take the money that I make and we do free soccer camps. We I'm the sponsor for the only volunteer based soccer club in our community and that's growing like wildfire. We have huge events. We give money to kids who can't afford to play. I was I was a kid who couldn't afford to play. Like my family got money for me to play. And so I'm really that's how I got into it. Is it was just like I didn't feel like it could have the impact in soccer and honestly it broke me. It hurt me so bad. And I thought the only other way I could do something that meant something was to serve in the community and that's what I built this entire real estate company around and then it you know I met Laura and I was like just so impacted by her story and the correlations in our lives and honestly guys former pro athletes make the best damn realtors I'm I'm not kidding <laughs> like they are hard working they grind they know how to wake up every morning and get it done they think outside of the box and they serve like they are all about team and if you can't know that if you're like a realtor that just thinks that it's just like you're in it for yourself you're gonna you're gonna fail man and so that's how we look at it every year we start and we're like okay who's on our team this year and that's how we treat our sellers and um now I get all passionate about it, but that's great. That's where we're at. You got and all the then, sound bites. yeah, and then, <laughs> and then I met Laura. I'm like, hey, I know you're in soccer. Um, she was kind of getting her heart broke a little bit too, unfortunately. And I said, let's go change our community for the better. And she did. <laughs> and that's the end of the story. <laughs> so are you the one that steps in between the lines, and then you get super intense on negotiations? Is that your? Uh, what's your role on the team? Cat's <laughs> no, a great negotiator. Cat's great at all the aspects of real estate, which is why, I mean, about 10 years ago, I thought about going into real estate and I just decided for various reasons it wasn't the right time. And then, um, you know, not to completely mirror Cat's story, but I also had, you know, my own situation where I was, um, I'm going to say, certainly mistreated uh, and in some ways kind of pushed out of the youth game at the time. And so uh, in that environment, uh, two of the top women in soccer who went the furthest, and she's A license and B license and Division One players and pro players getting pushed out of the youth game. Just, just want to put that out there. <laughs> anyway, keep going. The youth game, as in you helping youth soccer. So I, I was at the time I was directing uh, a development academy in the area, and COVID hit, and and. Uh, certain people in a youth organization and a youth soccer club in the area um, and I'm just going to say other bad actors took the opportunity to when everybody was stuck in their cars and couldn't communicate and couldn't talk about where I was um, make sure that I wasn't there yeah yeah so yeah I mean COVID started and then um, I no longer was allowed to go out to the field to work with the youth players um, I didn't do anything weird. I didn't do anything wrong. Um, I just was asked not to go out to a tryout. And I said, are you sure? Like, I feel like it looks weird if I just don't show up. As the director of this program, I feel like it's going to look kind of strange. Um, and they said, no, we don't want you to go. So I didn't go. Hmm. And then um, for a number of years, uh, I wasn't able to really coach in youth um, for for a number of, of reasons. that I'm not sure I'll go too far into it here. But... Um, yeah, so in the midst of that climate and COVID happening, and I also was blessed to get um, be offered uh, the head coaching position at George Fox University, which has been amazing. Yeah. Great people, beautiful people there. Uh, love the athletes there. It's just been really fun to turn that, that program around from, from where it was. 
Uh, we've had a lot of success out there. We just ran a free camp out there on uh, New Year's Eve. I've done that for the last three years. Like 100 we, plus kids showing up. I'd say we sell out, but we don't charge anyone. Yeah, it's <laughs> we a total sell out, $0. <laughs> but, you know, we get great coaches like Kat to come back out that aren't really coaching and are, you know, selling a lot of houses to, hey, you're still good at coaching. Come back out and do this right? for three hours. Um, so, yeah, we, we sell out. Uh, we have over 100 kids. And now... You know, we get coaches to volunteer and people call me now. They call me and ask me if they can come out. And then also because I had a U10 program at, a, at FC Portland for a few years and um, because I've known so many kids growing up in the Portland area, now they call me for this camp because they, they went to the camp as, as athletes and now they're a little bit older and they, they want to come back and, and be mentors. So doing those kind of things are a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, so I, I took the position at, at George Fox University. And that's my way of, of being in the game. It's been, I guess, impossible for me to kick the habit of being involved in soccer. <laughs> uh, but also when you're working with really great people and you find that home, uh, you're just really fortunate. So along with that and, and knowing she, And that she should never be out of it. You're such an amazing coach, I, honestly. Like the fact that you get to do both is huge. I think the community needs you in the game too. Oh, that's sweet of you. Yeah, <laughs> but I um truth. yeah. So when <laughs> truth, <laughs> but I what I found was, and I've told Kat this a number of times. I don't know if you agree with me now or not, but I say that the real estate real estate is a little bit, a lot of bit like youth soccer. The time commitment is similar. It's evenings on weekdays. It's weekends. Um, you got to find players. You got to develop players. You got to you know you got to find clients. You got to work through deals. You got to negotiate. Um, all of those same skills apply. Uh, it's a lot of the same stuff. So a lot of coaching, a lot of coaching, a lot of, a lot of educating, a lot yeah. of mentoring. Mm -hmm. um, so once I got into it, I was like, okay, yes, this is you know a skill set that I, I have to some degree. Um, my grandma was really big in real estate in Southern California before women were really in it back in the '70s and early '80s. Um, so I have some background in it, and I was around it somewhat growing up. So um, you know, I kind of knew what that that situation was. So. Yeah, always in the back of my head for whatever reason. I mean, I know that I went to a great college and a great high school and, um, you know, like a lot of people go into these careers and, and move into these, you know, salary jobs. And yeah, I've, I've, you know, done some of that in coaching. But for some reason, real estate's always just appealed to me. And I love it. I love it as an investment for people. I think it's really wise. And so in pursuing it, I feel like I'm just helping people. I feel like I'm helping people either buy their first home or get into investment properties or, you know, whatever the situation is. I know that long term, these people are going to benefit from from the mentorship and, and from working with them. So, um, you know, I feel the same way about coaching. That's awesome. Yeah. So giving back to your community, starting with helping coach people from the ground up, from the youngsters all the way up and then also in real estate within the community, um, I guess kind of to wrap it all up. You're also both broadcasting for the Thorns as well? Yeah, we're both on uh, KPTV, Fox 12, for um, Thorns pre and post games. Um, it's been super awesome, but unfortunately, we haven't been able to. The setup isn't such that we get to do it together. <laughs> yeah, we have to always do it apart. So we're like, <laughs> always like, Laura's coaching at George Fox, so Kat's here. And then it's like, now Laura's back and Kat's gone. So th this will be great because we get to do this podcast is is. We both lived through so much of like this game changing. We've also seen the heartbreak on it. We've seen the highs, we see the lows. We get to be with the thorns all of the time. We get to have our hands in in the NWSL. We get to be in our community through real estate. We get, I'm, you know, we're both talking to schools. I go to the local schools, elementary schools, high school. I talk about health, I talk about fitness, I talk about mental health, um, you know, and. It's all tied together, you know. We're on. We we say as seen on TV and our real estate stuff, but like nobody calls me and is like, "Hey, I want to buy a house with you because you're on Thorns TV." It's usually like, "Hey, I heard from my aunt that you literally went in there and you had a contractor paint the house and you staged it and you helped her declutter it." and you had a professional cleaner go in there and you did a video that got 5,000 views on YouTube and you you literally changed her life and got her more money and then found her a house off market and I want a piece of that. So as much as like somebody sat in a, a meeting one time and they were like, yeah, Kat Tar finished, this year we finished number 12 and like what, almost 3,000 realtors. So awesome. 
It's pretty awesome. Wow. And somebody said, well, it doesn't hurt that she's a former pro soccer player and on TV. And I was just like, bro, you, I work you no full clue. time. Yeah. I got a four-year-old on my hip. I coach both my boys. I'm in the community. I haven't seen you do one thing in this community. And so, like, that's a little pain point for me is, like, well, I want to, if I can, just jump yeah. in here because mm-hmm. – the, the proof isn't in like you know anybody being on TV or anything else. I mean, I haven't gotten one call where somebody was like, "Saw you uh, talking about soccer on TV." Do they so let I you do your own you. ads live on air? Uh, no, I talked. I actually was like, "Can I <laughs> can I buy some TV time?" Yeah. <laughs> I feel like this year it was always Jamba Juice. Nick was always doing a, some kind of like right? plug on Jamba Juice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> no, but the thing that people don't see behind the scenes is how much work goes into these transactions. And I mean, actually, it was Fabian once I thought and said it really, really well. He said that, you know, it's like clockwork. Like, you guys get leads, and then you just, like, they're done. And <laughs> I was like, it's it's a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of work behind the scenes between, you know, like, getting the lead and then, uh, you know, finding the house or selling the house. And then you go into a whole other thing where you're going into inspections, and you find things, and you go into negotiations and that. And, you know, there's a lot of steps to it, and there's a lot of work to be done. And, you know, I the reason that I was excited when the opportunity came up to, to work with Kat was that, I've seen how hard she works, and I also like to work hard, and I like to surround myself with people that want to work hard and want to do the right thing by their community. And so, you know, I got to see behind the scenes of, like, you know, sometimes we'll just be packing boxes for people. We'll be, I mean, we stage our, we stage houses ourselves sometimes. Stagers can't show up, and, you know, yeah. we end up cleaning things. We end up doing whatever needs to be done, not unlike sports. You have to do what needs to be done at the time in order to get the win. Mm-hmm. And we feel the same way about real estate. It's just another way to, to get it done. Yeah, I got a call literally on my way here from a lender that I've never worked with before. She's like, I have a guy. He's in his 50s. He's been through four realtors. He has PTSD. He's a vet. He's had a lot of loss. And I think you're going to be really great for him. And I was like, what? (laughs) She's like, I've seen you from afar. And I just, honestly, you care about people. Like, you do so much for the people you serve. And I just think you're going to be good for him. And I realized, like... If that's what I'm going to be known for, have at it. <laughs> I love it, man. I'm just like, I feel like You're that's, doing something right. I'm doing something right. Mm-hmm. And it, it's natural. Like, it all stems from that little kid on the soccer field who just knew that she wanted to be a part of something. Like, that's all I cared about. I just wanted to be on that field with other people. And so it feels good where we've landed. Awesome. Well, Kat and Laura, really appreciate your time. Looking yeah, forward for to it working together in the future and with what we're doing here with the couch GM and real yeah. estate and everything. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Maybe we can team up with uh, Mr. Connor on some mortgage loans too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll look forward to it. We'll, we'll figure out a name. We'll be all right. Yeah. yeah. We'll get there. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys. Bye. Sweet. Yay.